Hello everyone. Welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and this is my co-host today, Pippa. And we're going to talk about what fools Harry and Meghan are. Yes, I just went through the latest excerpt again of Tom Bauer's new book that has been serialized in the time. And oh my gosh, Harry and Meghan are some of the world's biggest nincompoops. Like that's the only only way to put it. And I just think it's just super interesting to see kind of what they've done and how they've really just made an epic mess. They could have had the opportunity to brush shoulders with some of the most influential and important people in the whole world. And they decided to listen to Sunshine Sacks and Americans PR people and Jessica Mulroney and David, what is this, Daniel Martin, her makeup artist. They just decided to focus on the people who were making money off of them I wanted to make money off of them. It is super interesting. So anyways, guys, if you haven't been to Royal News Network before, hello, my name is Brittany, and this is Pippa. She's gonna help me today. Cause I just thought I was away for a day and I think she missed me. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hold her. She'll let me hold her like this. So we'll see how long this goes until she just decides she doesn't wanna do that anymore. But anyways, guys, like I said, we're just gonna talk about basically how Harry and Meghan just really, really, messed up. They really, really just saw the light. They saw this, this un, unreachable goal and they're just like, you know what? Not unreachable goal. They just saw the bright lights of Hollywood, the stacks and piles of money that was just out there waiting for them. And the, the crowds, the, the crowds that loved them, cheering them on every step of the way, they really thought that that was going to be their future after Mexit. And you know what? That was not the case. And really, they just followed the advice of people who had no clue what it meant to be in the monarchy, no clue how to negotiate with something like a palace. And just really, Harry and Meghan at the end of the day, I think look like utter fools who wasted an unbelievable opportunity because hey, Meghan wanted to be she wanted to break the internet. Well, honey, I don't think you ever really truly broke the internet like Kim Kardashian, and I don't think you ever will. But anyways, guys, if you haven't been to Real News Network before, hello, my name is Brittany. Pippa's usually not in my videos, but she's just fun. And I talk about everything related to Royal, so that's news, gossip, fashion, jewelry, television shows, movies, and history. I do that all right here, so if you wanna subscribe, <laughs> that would be great. And like I said, Harry and Meghan in the Tom Bauer book. Oh, there were some juicy, bits in this and shows just how completely out of touch, how just Megan did not care. She just wanted her American version of fame. And I actually have done a whole video about the difference between celebrities and, and royalty because Megan just thought that being a royal was just like an extra level of being a celebrity. And it just, it just really wasn't. And I think she's, she made just a disastrous decision, it led Harry into one disastrous decision after another. But let's start off with some of the excerpts. Hold on, I'm gonna put her down. So say bye to Pippa. Say bye bye Miss Pippa. Oh, thank you. I just love getting love from a dog. So it starts off with Harry and Meghan visiting Charles at his home. And I thought this was super fascinating because apparently the visit he said, Tom Bauer, this is, the visit was used to brief the media that Charles had become attached to Meghan and admired her interest in history and furniture. I don't think Meghan has, has any inkling or interest in either of those topics, except for the furniture piece is very, very expensive. Unspoken was Charles's bewilderment about the American. He had never really understood her or what she wanted. That week, his irritation about Thomas Markle's TV appearances had grown. So I find this super interesting that Charles just didn't know what to do with her, didn't know what to make of her. And again, I think this all goes down to the fact that, and I, you know, supposedly he came up with the nickname Tungsten for her. You know, I, I'm sure that's probably somewhat true, but also somewhat not true. Just looking at this, that he didn't really understand her, I think goes back to, I did a video about Megan's interview with the Vanity Fair guy, and she's very coy and manipulative, and not coy in a good way, coy in a bad way. So she's very, very manipulative. And I think he, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I'm sure she hits his radar, was hitting Charles's radar is, okay, you know, she's being very nice and interesting, but there's something in the back of my head that keeps telling me 
I don't feel like this is totally right. I feel like something's wrong. What? Is, what? There's something. It's just, just like you know, the inkling in the back of your mind that you know, six the spidey sense. He was getting that from her, but Camilla was all over it. So it says Camilla epitomized the best and probably some of the worst characteristics of a practical, solid English upper middle class woman, undereducated, expert at expert as a horsewoman, a poor cook, keen to do good with lots of old friends. She was grounded and not grand. As a no-nonsense, self-deprecating, plain speaker with a good sense of humor who, when necessary, displayed a stiff upper lip, Camilla was the most comfortable sloshing through the mud of barbour and gumshoes. I probably pronounced that wrong, I apologize. For, hard -working Amer for the hardworking American graduate and feminist, brought up in the sunshine of the by the specific Pacific, the class ridden hunting world galloping across English shires. Oh, that was quite the class ridden hunting world galloping across the English shires, invariably under leaden skies, was unattractive. The stark differences between the Cotswolds and California aroused in Camilla's sense that Megan was an adventuress from Los Angeles. Unlike Charles, Camilla could see through the American actress's coitish smiles and tactile performance. During her lifelong experience in England's country set, Camilla had occasionally spotted self-important adventuresses. They were the sort she might call a minx. She found it hard to believe that Megan would sacrifice her independence to serve quietly as a team player. This is incredibly telling that that Camilla was catching on. She knew Megan was fake from the jump because if you are in that world of the British aristocracy and Camilla, I guess, apparently was upper middle class. So maybe she wasn't, I mean, she was basically in the aristocracy, let's be honest. But if you are in those circles, you can spot a fake a mile away. And she, she caught on to Megan immediately. And that's probably why Megan didn't like her is and Catherine probably caught on to it pretty quickly too. And it was one of those things where I'm sure they were just like, okay, well maybe she isn't that. I mean, I see it, but let's just give it time and giving it time did not help matters in the slightest. But again, that they caught on to Megan pretty much immediately. And I think, I think there, for most people, if you meet Megan Markle and you're mostly a normal person, she just, I would guess, and this is just my supposition, I don't know for sure, the hairs maybe on the back of your neck would stand up a bit. You would just kind of pay more attention and be kind of cautious and curious and yet also a little concerned because there's something about, clearly, there's something about her that hits people's radars as wrong. They don't trust her, they don't like her, they don't like her intentions. It just see, all seems very dangerous. So I think clearly there's something about her that really, really just sinks into people and they're just, they just feel it and they're like, ugh, no. So it goes on to talk about Megan's frustration with the palace. She said, Tom Bauer wrote, Megan was angry that palace officials refused to protect her image. She refused to accept that staff were not employed to promote her as an individual, but pl instead placed her in the grid of the royal family. Megan seemed isolated, vulnerable, and stifled by convention, apparently unwilling to accept that unlike Hollywood, no one was counting the box office receipts of the crowd she attracted. She was waging a struggle for which she was not suited. Scornful of the palace's explanation that attacking the media would rebound on her, she adopted Hollywood's rule book and took the initiative. Again, to her own demise, because she's not good at this. She's really, really not. She thinks she's Machiavelli, and she, she really, really stinks. Megan went on to complain that Kate did not have to live with the latest ir irritating revelation, such as Urban Dictionary's newly published definition of being Megan Markled, a verb for ghosting or deposing of people once you have no use or benefit from them anymore without regard to genuine human relationship. Seemingly stung by the criticism, Megan forgot an actress's cardinal rule. Pose with humility, even if it is false. Despite being raised in Hollywood studios to work with others, Megan became increasingly fragile, demanding that the palace staff view the world from her perspective. In defense, she demanded retaliation against her critics. But here's the thing, Megan didn't see it from the palace's perspective. She demands people see it from her perspective. It's her, it's her, it's all about her. And much like Amber Heard and much like Elizabeth Holmes, 
She is the architect of her own failure because she cannot see beyond herself. She cannot see it. She cannot see the bigger picture. She could not see that if she played her cards right, she and Harry might spend much of their life wearing tiaras and going to various engagements throughout Europe representing the UK at weddings, at funerals, at state visits, at birthday parties, like all these different things that the other royals in, Brit uh, in, the UK, in Europe do. That job right now is currently held by Edward and Sophie. Edward and Sophie go to all the Swedish weddings, the Norway weddings, the usually the kind of this, you know, some of the birthday celebrations. There are birthday celebrations like huge ones with tiaras and parties and all these sorts of things. That could have been maybe Harry and Meghan, but no. Meghan kept listening to her PR team in the United States, which was doing her utterly no favors. But the instigation for, for this kind of hubris that really developed, I mean, I think Megan is a narcissist. I think she has a gigantic ego. Her ego got super, super inflated when they went to Australia. From the outset, the reception for the Sussexes in Australia was ecstatic. Large crowds cheered the couple, delighted by Megan's special news that she was pregnant. The Commonwealth, everyone agreed, would be enhanced by the birth of the royal family's first mixed race child in the contemporary era. Harry and Meghan would be at the forefront of modernizing the monarchy. Throughout those first days, the tour was perfect. Their visit on the second day to a family 500 miles east of Sydney, bringing banana cake baked, I'm gonna say supposedly, because who knows if she actually cooked it, by Meghan. That pr the previous night aroused euphoria. In parallel, Harry score scored another triumph. He opened the Invictus Games and scaled Sydney's Harbour Bridge to replace an Australian flag with the flag of Invictus. The couple were loudly praised for arranging free flights from Britain for participants in the games and welcoming and members of charities and warmly welcoming them at receptions. Their daily success recorded by glowing photos sent Australia Republicans into retreat. However, the nude at the Sussexes Sydney headquarters was by contrast miserable. Although the couple had arrived with four staff, Megan had decided that she needed to be surrounded by people she trusted. At her request, her friends Jessica and Ben Mulroney had flown in from Canada to provide round-the-clock support. Mulroney doubled as Megan's stylist as she worked through her show-stopping wardrobe, which was a disaster, by the way. Every night, Harry trawled social media, searching for snide comments on the internet. Every morning, he and Meghan turned on their phones to surf the internet. Thin-skinned, they were inflamed by the slightest criticism. Both bombarded their staffs with demands for removals of the criticism. One of the instances was a outfit of Megan's cost 19,960 pounds. I'm gonna guess that was the Oscar, the 10,000 pound Oscar de la Renta dress and the rest of her ensemble. As a sign of Megan's intention, she also wore a Serena Williams brand jacket. Soon afterwards, it was promoted on Instagram. Duchess Meghan in Our Boss Blazer, a collection fit for royalty. Once again, Meghan was irate. Staff were blamed for not pressing Hollywood style all those embarrassing media reports. Her mistake, she would lament, was believing when, when they said, I would be protected. So Meghan wanted protection from herself and her own stupid mistakes. If you wear a $19,000 outfit, you will be called out for it if it wasn't appropriate to wear it. You know play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Like she, again, it's all goes back to her, but she could not see it. it was everybody else's fault. And again, Australia is the trip. We got the alleged incident where she kind of threw or kind of pushed hot tea towards someone. And we also had the Fiji disaster where she demanded to leave after like two minutes and her security officer looked just shattered and just like so unbelievably tense. Harry inflamed emotions by repeatedly drawing comparisons between his wife and Diana. Australia's huge welcome for the Sussexes was comparable to Diana's tour of Australia with Charles and baby William in 1983. Tens of thousands had flocked every day to glimpse the princess. Australian Republicans, even the Prime Minister, credit Diana with sabotaging their campaign to remove the Queen as head of state. The more Harry drew parallels with his mother, the more Meghan must have been convinced of her importance in the monarchy. This comparison to Diana that Harry and Meghan constantly make, I think does them no favors. I said this, I think recently in the video, cause I'm gonna try to do two video uploads on Sunday. I don't know if I'll achieve that, but I think Harry and Meghan make those comparisons to Diana to their own demise because Diana did not die because of the paparazzi. She, she was killed in a drunk driving accident and she would have lived if she had been wearing her seatbelt. 
So that's really, really at the heart of it, what went on when Diana died. But Harry and Meghan, Harry, I think, has mythologized this in his mind. And I think Meghan has been fueling it from her perspective as an American. As an American, we were told it was the paparazzi. They were terrible. They were horrible. They were following Diana. Yet, if you looked deeper into the situation, Diana had a very kind of symbiotic relationship with the cameras. Like, she simultaneously hated them, yet called paparazzi quite a bit to get pictures of her. And so she kind of in a way also kind of contributed to what happened to her. And it's just very, very sad to see that Harry and Meghan were drawing comparisons that there were never there, were never there. And this is kind of pointed out here. Harry, who was 12 when Diana died, perhaps could not fully understand his mother, her work, abilities, priorities, and historic significance. She is both a traditionalist and an I iconoclast, a mischievous revolutionary, and a selfless loyalist to the monarchy. Individual royals Diana knew must conform or the institution would lose its legitimacy. legitimacy. Her strength was the public's rec recognition of her vulnerability. The Sussexes had convinced themselves that their Australian success had blessed them with Diana's magic. Never having studied British history or politics or shown interest in biographies, Megan also perhaps could not understand that Diana had won the public's affection after years of work. Neither she nor Harry could grasp that emulating Diana required time to weave a narrative and create a brand from which influence would, sh would flow. Unlike Megan, Diana never needed to seek money or fame. Perhaps encouraged by Harry, Megan appeared to conjure a fantasy that she could provide the leadership the monarchy required. Her activism could would enhance the brand. To her staff, she gave the impression she believed she personified the monarchy's importance. This just grandiose sense of self-importance does her no favors. And it's clear part of what's feeding this, and it's in the next section of this, is her own brand management from the United States. They're like, you are the best, the, 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 the coverage is incredible here in the States and all those sorts of things. And it's like, you are the future, you are the future. But she was not. She was married to the sixth in line to the throne. Not the second, not the third, not the fourth, not the fifth, the sixth in line. As time goes on, her importance diminishes, as does Harry's. That's how monarchies work. Before they knew it, it would have been the Cambridge kids. And who knows, maybe a Cambridge, one of the Cambridge kids would have fallen in love with somebody in Africa. Let's say, you know, maybe somebody from Uganda, from Kenya, and who was maybe darker skinned than Megan is. And they would come and that would be the future. Here's the thing, and I'm a historian, so I guess <laughs> this is my perspective. And, you know, just having been a historian for many years, I just, and reading a lot of history, I see this all the time. People always say, well, you know, Usain Bolt, he's the fastest man alive. There will be somebody who's faster than him. Tom Brady's the greatest athlete in the world, you know, in the NFL. You know, somebody will beat his record. Nobody is immune from somebody surpassing them and doing it better. So Megan thinks that she is the future. No, she's a cog in a machine. The future is with somebody else. And even if, yes, her marriage with Harry may have been groundbreaking for that moment, there'll be another groundbreaking moment in, you know, a decade or two. There'll be a third, there'll be a fourth, there'll be a fifth. Like you, yourself, just because you're a mixed race and American does not mean that you have fundamentally changed everything about the monarchy. You haven't. And nobody is, you, and you cannot fundamentally change the brand of the monarchy because that's not your job. That is left to queen, the queen, Charles and William. For years, Meghan had a PR team and friends who all fed her sense of self-importance. And it went into the stratosphere after she married into the monarchy. Because this is the thing, all of them were after one thing. It's not the future of the monarchy. It's not, you know, establishing a long legacy of good charitable works. It comes all down to money. It's all about the money. And that's what led them to ruin, was this pursuit of money and greed, being fed to them partially by people who just wanted to make money off of them. And they made just 
astronomically stupid decision. So it goes on. Naturally, her American agents and lawyers were encouraging. For years, they had struggled to land parts for her. Now, they believe she can earn millions from her activism. Of course, she would need an American base and a foundation in which to deposit these proceeds. There was even, she was told, an American billionaire who might provide startup sponsorship. Her advisors neither understood that their strategy was incompatible with the monarchy, nor did they care. In their uncluttered scenario, Megan would earn millions and they would reap the commission. So she allowed them to dictate things they should never have dictated for her because she saw she saw money signs and they saw money signs. So they're like, yeah, yeah, do all this stuff. Keep doing it. Even if in the long run, it utterly destroys her brand, which it has. October 23rd, one week into the tour, the die was cast. Harry and Meghan seemed to have convinced themselves that William was jealous of their success in Australia. The time was right for change. They needed to break out of the Kensington Palace's claustrophobic fishbowl. Harry proposed that the palace should rewrite the rule book. Rather than Meghan being a dutiful member of supporting cash, she should star as a campaigner, independent of the Cambridges and even the Queen. The commercialization plans, especially the Sussex's transactional relationships, unnerved the palace and convinced officials that the couple were heading beyond their control. Meghan in turn believed she had good reason to be suspicious. All her requests were now being referred to the palace and regularly the Queen's officials directed her staff to prioritize its intentions over Meghan's. More importantly, without the consultation of a legal constraint that had been opposed around Sussex Royal, their foundation. So it actually came out in here as well that apparently the palace to kind of constrain Harry and Meghan actually made instead of their 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 charitable organization a foundation they made it a charity so a foundation they could conceal some information and a charity everything had to be public and Harry and Meghan were kind of incensed about this they were not expecting that and they were rather frustrated that the palace set it up that way but I think the palace was being smart because they were very concerned about what Harry and Meghan were doing behind the scenes and even now with Archwell like how much do we know about how money and everything is really being spent. I mean, they're not making that much money apparently, but you know, there's a lot of questions about that. And apparently it was something the palace was very worried about. As they were on obviously their kind of break in Canada, the couple were working very, very hard. Well, mostly Megan was working really hard to secure their deals with Netflix and Spotify. And they were re-registering the TIG. They were doing all these behind the scenes dealings, trying to shore up all this you know, financial, all these businesses in order to make themselves money because Megan could not handle the fact that she could not capitalize financially off being a royal. So at the end it says the queen, after consulting Charles and William, took control. Convinced that Harry and Meghan would never resume normal life in Britain, the trio agreed that the monarchy's future should be focused on reinvigorating brand Cambridge, which I actually think they've done quite a good job at. That was made easier by Charles's and William's becoming reconciled over the previous months. Without any formal announcement, the monarchy would be slimmed down. The irritants, especially Andrew and Harry, would be removed earlier than planned. Their agreement was conveyed by the Queen during her 2019 Christmas Day, Christmas Day television broadcast. As Harry watched his grandmother fam from Vancouver, he was staggered. Four silver-framed family photographs had been carefully placed behind her. They showed the Queen's father, Prince George VI, Prince Philip, Charles, and Camilla, and finally William and his family. To Harry's Fury. There was no photograph of himself, Meghan, and Archie. The Windsors were airbrushing the Sussexes out of history. Isolated on Vancouver Island increased the Sussexes' sense of outrage. Listening to Harry's discussions with his family and officials in Britain, Meghan was furious that they were not accepted on their own terms. The encouragement from her Los Angeles advisors was intoxicating. The Sussex brand, Meghan was assured, offered the same global opportunities as those re reaped by the Obamas. They could exploit their royal status in films, books, finance, and the digital world. By endorsing a big consumer corporation, the Sussexes could earn tens of millions of dollars. Their first step would be a major interview. Oprah Winfrey was waiting. So here's what it all comes down to. It's all about Megan 
and the money. And what's interesting as well as the details in this article, how Megan's makeup artist, Daniel Martin, and her friend, Jessica Mulroney, and her other friend, Abigail Spencer, had all benefited financially and in clout from their relationship with Meghan Markle. And if you look at it as well, again, it's incredibly telling. What was driving this was Megan's ambitions and the whispering in her ear of her American-based PR team. But Harry and Meghan, by listening to them, revealed the fools that they are. This PR team knows nothing about the monarchy. They would have no clue that Harry and Meghan were had not spent enough time growing and developing a relationship with the British people to jump ship and still think that they'll have the same clout as Harry's mother Diana did when she divorced Charles in the 90s. That was never going to happen. Harry and Meghan had not even stayed two years. I mean, even when, now when they use their titles of Duke and Duchess of Sussex, people kind of laugh at them. I mean, it's just kind of like... <laughs> you know, you, you, that thing you did for like a year and a half before you quit because it was too hard. Like, you know, it's just ridiculous that they continue to cling, cling so desperately to these titles. But Megan, but it's because Megan followed her PR company. All the people who were only in it for the bottom line, only in it for the money, had no clue about this bigger the monarchy is bigger than one single person. And they made the mistake of not realizing that Harry and Meghan, their fame, their money, their brightness, their shine comes from their closeness to the crown. I've used this analogy before and I'll use it again. The crown is the sun and the rest of the planets behind it. The further you are back, the colder it is. And the less the light of the sun or a, i.e. the crown shines on you. So Harry and Meghan were, you know, several back at that point. They were, you know, basically Uranus way out there. And, but you know, in terms of working royals, they were really Mars. So, you know, because the queen is Mercury, Charles is Venus, William is Earth, you know, Harry is Mars. And the Cambridge children obviously would technically be kind of the rest of them, but you know, they're not working royals. Anyways, but as soon as Harry and Meghan made the decision to step away from the monarchy, because they kept a, Megan was ambitious. She just wanted to make money. She's obviously, I hate to say it, just seems like a rather greedy person, was only in it for the dollar signs and the fame and fortune. She thought she could step away and take the sun with her. But that's the thing. You're, as a royal, your crown is only as good as how close you are to the sun. Harry and Megan's shine wore off pretty much immediately as soon as they left the monarchy. And it's been tarnishing ever since. I mean, they're not even this in our solar system anymore. They're way out in the nether reaches. And it's like they follow the worst advice possible and it's led them to ruin. I mean, they may think they're kind of okay, but they're really laughing stocks. I mean, people laugh at them. Like in the comments, they're all terrible. You know, if Harry and Meghan are thin skinned now, it's definitely no better. But they, they decided that instead of you know, appreciating the monarchy, the institution, and really putting in the time, they just went with the flashing lights of Hollywood. Because that's what Megan really always wanted. She always wanted to be famous, infamous, but she didn't have the talent. So what did she do? She grabbed her hooks into Harry, and he was stupid enough to let her. And as it continued, it's just shown them that they are fools. They are fools who had no clue what they were doing made incredibly stupid decisions and now are facing a future without potentially titles for themselves and their children being ostracized from the monarchy entirely and basically just on the cusp of perhaps even losing their Spotify and Netflix deals because they have no content for either of those. And those companies, even though they were, they were shined by the lights of the monarchy and everything, they're not going to give Harry and Meghan the time of day if they can't produce anything. That's not how businesses work. So yes, you got the deals, but you got to get the goods. If you can't get the goods, you'll lose the deals very, very quickly. Because that's how the real world works. Not the royal world, the real world. And Harry and Meghan, again, have made the crucial mistake of thinking that they controlled everything, that they were, they, that they were the future of the monarchy, rather than just a passing fancy that would fade as it always does for those who are not in the main line of the succession. Well guys, that is it for the end of this video. Pippa and I bid you farewell. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, and I look forward to seeing you again oh so soon. Bye.